Hello, Abnormal Investigations family. Hope everybody is doing well. Got another good encounter for you today. Also wanted to remind you guys that if you're not part of the Patreon or the membership of the YouTube channel, you can join both of those and get extra content. There's going to be a video released of me and my moderators discussing new things up and coming to 2024. It will be released to members and Patreon only. Now, that doesn't mean that our other viewers won't know what's happening. It's just you guys are going to know first. You're going to get to hear the behind the scenes, the planning, and the places we're looking at, and be able to interact with us on those items. All right, guys. Now, moving on. You can use this name if you want to. It is not my real name. I've never told this story to anyone before. I don't want people to believe that I'm crazy. I'm a professional, and if anyone were to link this story to me, it would affect my practice. But despite that risk, I have to tell someone of this experience, even if only anonymously. It happened back when I was 10 years old in the summer of 1979. Looking back, I had an ideal ch childhood, <clears throat> which is quite rare now. I'm from the Triad area of North Carolina, from an area that was relatively rural at the time. I was pretty much a free-range kid, so long as I was home for supper, there weren't any problems. Much of my time was spent playing in the woods and creeks within a mile or so of our home. Naturally, being a bit of a country boy, I was obsessed with hunting, fishing, guns, bows and arrows, but especially deer hunting. I read hunting magazines ferociously, ferociously, sorry guys, soaking up everything I could do about the habits of white-tailed deer from when we were from when and where they moved and what they ate depending on the time of the year. Furthermore, I learned their seasonal diet and how to read deer signs from rubs, scrapes, spore to finding their trails. The experience I wish to relate did not occur in North Carolina, but up in Virginia. It is a memory that haunts me yet and is something I will never be able to forget. As much as I enjoyed the woods and creeks of my home, my grandmother's place in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia was special. That was wilderness compared to the woods at my home for sure. Her land in Carroll County was on a ridge about one and a half hours from home. It was just a three-room cabin, then without year-round running water. When the weather was good enough for the unpaved mountain roads to be drivable, we were the most weekends we would spend the day roaming all across the mountains, from the top of the ridge to the river below. The nearest neighbor was about a mile away on a state-maintained gravel road, but even then, most of the homes in that area were vacation homes and were normally empty. I was, it was a Saturday in June, and school was out for the summer. We would go up Friday evening and come back <clears throat> Saturday night. My grandmother was very devout about probably the sincerest Christian I've ever known, but it was Saturday morning, and I had the entire day to explore the mountain. By this time, I had a fairly decent grasp, grasp of the habits of the local deer population. Deer are most active at dawn and dusk, and when under pressure, such as during heavy hunting, pressure will become mostly nocturnal unless they're in a rut. But this was June, and hunting season was months away, and the rut was a couple of months after that. So I made my plans to explore the creek by following it to the river, then the river upstream to the big rock, then hike up the rather steep mountain back to the cabin stopping for a rest at the shallow cave then make it back to the cabin around noon for something to eat then i had to help my grandmother's garden for a few hours as you can imagine that was a busy morning and afternoon but at 10 years old there was endless energy and i had decided to take my binoculars and watch the recently timbered patch of land from the top of the ridge once my chores were finished I set off with the promise to get back just before it got too dark. The only real agriculture in those mountains was raising beef cattle, hay, silage, and some cabbage. The apple orchards were mostly on the southern side of the Blue Ridge near the tourist areas. Most of what the deer ate around my grandmother's cabin at the time of year would have been tree or perennial brows and any annuals such as pulkweed and other green leafy plants. They would also obviously eat any berries that were starting to come in at about that time. There were a few hours of daylight remaining when I looked up the road to my binoculars and canteen of spring water. The wind had been blowing favorably all day. For those who don't know why you're in my dearest eyes, you will not fool his nose. 
The wind decides pretty much everything when it comes to hunting. On this day, the wind was favorable. It was blowing at a crosswind to me. When overlooking the cleared little valley, the cleared land when down the creek had been timbered the previous winter. It was lush and new growth for the deer to feast upon, but it was still low enough that an adult deer would be visible from my vantage point at the top of the ridge. The other side of the creek remained in timber and thick thickets. I got settled in a good couple hours before dusk. I wanted to be there in plenty of time for the woods to calm down for my walk to spot the long before the deer came out. I didn't want to spook any deer on the walk. As I said, I got settled into my spot and made it comfortable and as good constructed and rough blind by placing some leaf branches into the ground to break up my outline, which took about 10 minutes. I stretched out and scanned the clear cut area below me, double checking the likely areas I expected the deer to come out of the woods into the clearing above. Then I just rested enjoying <clears throat> the pleasant evening watching birds and small animals. After about an hour and a half the sun was starting to set and I took the last drink of water until it got dark. Suddenly there was a bit of movement down to my right. After scanning the area with the binoculars I saw that it was a deer and a new fawn. The doe paused at the edge of the clearing to make sure it was safe while occasionally checking her back trail. It then slowly moved out into the clearing quickly followed by the fawn. It was a large doe, which I was surprised to see one this large. And they tend to move slowly when they have their children. But the two deer were not alone. Another deer followed them. The three deer slowly worked their way up the creek, eating and looking behind them as if something was following them, as they did the whole time. The doe would pause to alert her fawn to suckle. It was then that I noticed some movement on the opposite hillside. It was in the thicket. Something large was slowly working its way down the hillside. The thicket was especially thick. While I could not see what was moving through it, its movement caused the thicket itself to move. I assumed it was another deer. By this time it was close to being dark. The three deer had taken about 30 minutes to work their way up to the little creek from where they had exited the woods. The expected deer, that I assumed had come from the thicket, had never left the thicket and crossed the creek though, which led me to believe that it was an old buck since they're usually more cautious. By this time I was almost dark. Fortunately though, my binoculars gathered much of the light. The binoculars magnified and made everything brighter. If I were not using the binoculars, I would have never seen what happened next. Often since then, I wish I did not have the binoculars that day, and that I had left earlier, but that was not to be. What I saw next has never left me since then. The three deer reached a spot close to the last spot that I had seen the movement through the thicket. By this time, it was almost dark. Fortunately, though, my binoculars were still working the way they should. Just a moment after the deer once again checked their back trail, there was a sudden commotion from the thicket. It was a large animal, leaped out of the thicket, clearing the small creek. The doe was taken down in an instant. What appeared to be a large wolf had the doe's throat in its powerful jaws. Astounded, I watched what appeared to be a wolf kill its prey. Besides the fact that there haven't been any deer in Virginia for about 150 years, I noticed that there was something else wrong. He was talking about wolves, guys, not deer. The wolf's proportions appeared wrong. Its front legs were too long. Its upper torso was too broad to be of the canine. But then it only became more strange. As the wolf's jaws crushed the windpipe of the doe, I noticed that the front paws were not paws at all. They appeared to be more like hands than paws. Paws which were then holding down the deer in its death rattle. As the wolf, like animal, dropped the deer from its jaws, it fell to the ground. The night action is what left me confounded until this day. The animal raised from its crouching position and stood on its hind legs to the height of, I would guess, and I'm only guessing, of about seven feet. It looked around, including my direction. It sniffed the air as it did so. Fortunately, 
the wind held steady and I was not downwind from it. I froze in terror I did not it did not see me. As the light faded I could tell that the beast was grayish in color. Its fur was thicker around its neck and down its back. Its muzzle was pronounced. Its hind legs were too short in comparison to its front limbs. While it's muscular, it was not overly so. The beast began tearing into the doe with its teeth. Guts and blood squirting everywhere. He wasn't eating like a normal animal would eat something. He was shredding it and pulling intestines out and throwing them up into the trees and throwing guts out into the water and just shredding and eating and getting it all over himself. He was being so vicious and filthy and the blood dripping from his fur. He just started just slaughtering this deer like he was still angry with it. It was then I decided that a silent retreat was the most sensible thing. God, I could be next. He could be doing that to me. All I can say is, I was ever so glad that I had made a decent blind to conceal my retreat, so that I was able to retreat unseen relatively quietly. And as I looked back before I left, he was taking the intestines, and I have no idea why, he was hanging them from the tree branches. I was so sick to my stomach, I was trying not to vomit, because I'm not a quiet vomiter, and I would have made noise, and then he would have for sure knew where I was at. As I run, dry gagging, Almost to throw up, sick, scared, afraid, my heart pounding. I could feel it in my temples. I ran as hard for my grandmother's as I could. And whenever I got there, I told her what I had seen. And she told me, that's why we always tell you to be back before dark. And you had not be out there hiding in the woods, letting things come up to you. Never go out there and hide. When you're in the woods, you need to be somewhat noisy so they know you're there. What do you think about that, guys? Do you think Grandma gave him sound advice? Should you be noisy when you're in the woods? Or should you or should you be quiet and stalking things? Does it matter? And why do you think it was hanging those up in the tree, guys? Do you think there was a reason for that? And why would it eat something and shred it the way it was shredding it if that was its meal and it was already dead? Do you believe it done it because it was angry? Do you believe it was practicing? Why do you think it was like that? Let me know in the comments, guys. And until next time, keep your head on a swivel and don't be something's dinner.